The Song of Solomon. Here we go. I, uh, I had a beard. Went to my, uh, went to Ben DeBose. He cuts my hair. And I said, Ben, how long shall I let my beard grow? And he said, I'd say until it interferes with your love life. <laughs> I miss my beard, but not that much. Let me just say. We should, uh, we should begin with the title. I think for many of us, the title is now and forever will be the Song of Solomon. But if you've ever seen it called something different, you may have noticed that some Bibles call it the Song of Songs. And if you wonder, is that a bunch of people who are just afraid to discuss authorship and they're not sure who wrote it and so they change it? That's not really it. It's the Hebrew title. In fact, look at the first verse. It's the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. In, uh, in English, if we want to talk about superlatives, we'll, tell, we'll say something's good, it's better, and it's best. If you're Hebrew back then, you say something's good, and then to make it really good, very good, and anyone go above that, you'd say it three times. Or you would say the best of the best or the good of the good. That's what this means. The song of all songs. Do you remember that last line in the book, The Princess Bride by William Goldman? I'm going to refer to this a lot during my tenure here, so you might as well read it or watch the movie. Here's the quote. Since the invention of the kiss, there have been five kisses that were rated the most passionate, the most pure, and this one left them all behind. I wonder if he was reading the Song of Solomon when he wrote that. And that brings me to my second introductory uh, point. Besides asking about the title, the second most common question I'll get about this book has to do with, uh, well, let's just use a line from Princess Bride. Is this a kissing book? Uh, I mean, is this really, you know, a PG-13 or worse book? about sex stuck in the middle of the Bible, or is this an allegory about Christ and the church? That's the other one I get. And you already know what the answer is. It's the answer to all questions like this. The answer is yes. But let's not get there too quickly. Let's start with sex. I, uh, I laugh out loud every time I remember this line from a speaker. It must have been 20 years ago that I heard this. He was lecturing on the Song of Songs at a... Uh, a, a school lectureship, and he made the strong point that it's about our relationships. When he was done, a couple of preachers came up to him. He said he knew there were preachers. It's a lot of polyester coming towards him. And he said, when they got to him, they tried to talk, but you could tell they would drop their voice whenever they got to the S word. And they'd say, you know, this book is not about sex. It's about Christ and the church. It's an allegory. And he said, let me understand this. In an allegory, correct me if I'm wrong, in an allegory, every detail corresponds to what it's allegorized, correct? He said, correct. He said, okay. So when he's drinking water out of her belly button, is that like how to select elders? You know, that just cracks me up every time I hear that. Um, we, we shy away from any thought about sex in the Bible. And that's a tragedy. Go, go with me back to the book of Genesis. Do you remember the way the humans were described, these two that were made in the garden before sin enters the garden? This is the language. They were naked and unashamed. Isn't that beautiful? That's the story. And God called that very good. In fact, the only thing in all creation that God looks around and says is not good is that any one of these human beings would be alone. And what mars the picture is not good reason and better sense. It's sin. And so what we have pictured in this book, at least for the first part that I want to emphasize here, first major point tonight, is a love story that is a true love story. We have two lovers who are naked and unashamed, and it was good. Now, I know that Hollywood 
has glamorized sex, sold sex, used sex, and so it's cheapened sex. And I know that so many of us face the real temptation or even the, the struggle of turning people into two-dimensional images rather than human beings, sexualizing others. Let me, let me add to the point. I know that our good faith efforts to help our children avoid the dangers of treating this beautiful thing in the wrong way at the wrong time. I know that our hearts are in the right place, but you know that sometimes, sometimes it can make the problem worse. There are a number of books being written now by people in my generation that are uh, questioning how they were raised. They'll use the phrase purity culture and they'll speak of it negatively. Um, and they say that it wreaked havoc on how they view themselves and how they view others. I'll give you one illustration from my own experience to tie into that. I still remember the youth gathering. It was actually at a school that I was attending. And the speaker takes out this beautiful flower and says, isn't this beautiful? Isn't this gorgeous? Now, I'm going to pass it around the room and I want everybody to just pinch one of the petals. And you know how this works, right? By the time it gets to the end of the room, it looks awful. This is you when you sleep around, he said. I know that the heart was in the right place. You know that too. But do you know what many of them, many of us, learned from that experience? First, I can't tell you about my past experiences. How embarrassing would that be after that story? Second, I've already messed up once. I might as well keep doing it. I mean, once the shines wear us off, what difference does it make? And worst of all, it puts the focus on the wrong thing. It makes me think that this is a bad thing, that my desires are bad things, and sex itself is some bad, dirty thing. Try flipping that switch on your wedding night. I've got a better idea. I wish that we would read the Song of Solomon more. I, I, I mean, read it carefully. This is not a compilation of cheap, tawdry sex scenes. And no, I'm not trying to go for the world record for using the word sex the most times in a sermon. This is a love story rooted in the healthiest of attitudes. They know each other. They know each other well. They are so deeply interested in each other that they talk about sex in terms of how it can serve each other. Look at some of these quotes. Go ahead and open your Bibles to there. Look in chapter two and verse seven. I saw this a couple of times as I was reading through the book. Chapter two and verse seven. Don't stir up or awaken love until it is time. Do you notice the language here? I'm not using you for me. Don't stir up or awaken love until it's time. This man shows how to truly see his woman. A few years ago, John Travolta starred in a uh, movie called Phenomenon. Uh, it's a good movie. I don't want to ruin it for you, so I won't kind of give it all away. But I will tell you this. Uh, he has some experiences that caused the townspeople to be wary of him, to shun him, to even fear him. But he's able to win over one woman, the single woman in town that all the townspeople wish that they could have won over. He does. Do you know how he does it? She makes chairs. They're not great chairs, but she makes chairs for a living. And he would go to the store often and he would say, oh, I've got some people who want to buy your chairs. I'm going to buy them. They're going to buy them from me. And he would buy her chairs. We're talking about tons of chairs. We find out later he stored them all in the back of his house. Near the end of the movie, some guys are in a, a bar and they're making fun of him for his unusual experiences. And the old wise man, who you can probably guess by now is Robert Duvall, he looks at them and he says, this is a great, great scene. He looks at one of them making fun and says, how is your lady love? He says, well, actually, we broke up. Duvall says, you did. That's too bad. 
Now, George, the Travolta character, he's got a lady love and she's sticking with him. And do you know why? Because he bought her chairs. Seems smart to me. You ever bought Lisa's chairs? Every woman has her chairs, something she needs to put herself into. Did you ever figure out what Lisa's chairs were and buy them? Nope. Read the Song of Solomon. Solomon found her chairs. And he went looking. I mean, he names every single part of her body. And he calls it beautiful. He sees the very best in her. Someone wrote a book years ago and titled it Sex Begins in the Kitchen. And his point was that it's not just about what you do in the bedroom. It's about the whole day, the whole experience, the whole life, the whole relationship, what you talk about over breakfast, really getting to know each other. That's what a good relationship is all about. He makes her feel like there is no one else in the world. And this is why God wanted sex to be monogamous. It's why he wanted it to be within a trusting, supporting marriage. So that our words would be authentic. That I see in you something that no one else can or has seen. And I think it is absolutely beautiful. There's a passage in Solomon that speaks to this. It's chapter 4, verse 12. Listen to this language. A garden locked is my bride. A spring locked, a fountain sealed. It's like I have a secret key to unlock a secret garden. And it's too wondrous for me to behold. And I love everything about it. Because I love everything about you. Read chapter 4. This is how it begins. You are all, this is chapter, uh, sorry, verse seven. You are altogether beautiful, my love. There is no flaw in you. Verse nine, you have captivated my heart. You have captivated my heart with one glance of your eyes. Women, do you ever worry that your husband is more interested in the big game or the new appetizer than in you? Look at verse 10. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils than any spice? Men, where is our desire? Look in chapter 7 and verse 10. This, listen to the line that she speaks about her man. I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. You can see why at the end of chapter four, she says, let my beloved come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. In other words, come and get it. And by the way, she finds his chairs too. Remember, Harley's the one who wrote the book, His Needs, Her Needs. And number one for her, he says, is affection to be adored, and to show her that you adore her. Number two is conversation, to truly hear her and to share how you feel with her. And number three is honesty and openness. Boy, you wonder if he was reading the Song of Songs. Those are just flowing out of every chapter. And what does a guy need? Well, Sexual fulfillment is near the top, according to his list, but so is admiration. To be admired, to be thought important, bold, daring, exciting, someone she looks up to. And wouldn't you know it, look at the way she talks about her man. Chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. The voice of my beloved, behold, he comes leaping over the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. What man doesn't want his woman to see him that way? Even old stags. 
chapter 2, verse 16. Let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. My beloved is mine, and I am his. And in chapter 3, she has a dream. She dreams that she can't find her man. And so she goes running into the streets to find him. And when she does, she says in verse 4, I held him and I wouldn't let him go. Hubba, hubba. At the end of chapter 5, look in verse 8. If you find my beloved, tell him I am sick with love. You know, some people ask her, what makes your man so special? That's chapter 5, verse 9. What makes your man so special? And starting in verse 10, all the way down to verse 16, she says, oh, he's radiant and ruddy. And then she describes every inch of his body and in the best possible light, too. And then she says, this is my beloved. Sex is good. It's holy. It's godly. It's supposed to be amazing. But that's because everything about her Everything about him is supposed to be amazing to you, to you. Chapter five, verse one, eat, friends, drink, and be drunk with love. Now, now, what can help you with that? Well, here are some tips. Do you notice how often in the book when he talks about her, he calls her my bride, he calls her my love. He also calls her my sister. Don't let that be weird. What he's saying is, I see you first as a child of God and second as someone with whom I live my life. I see you first as my equal in the sight of our shared Lord. And then I see you as my wife. Second, you know how she describes him? Chapter 5, verse 16. He's my lover and he's my friend. My friend. Don't you think everything is better if your relationship is so good that you speak of each other as your best friend? And not just that, they support each other. I mean, literally, in chapter 8, verse 3, his left hand is under my head. His right hand embraces me. The language is, I feel safe. I feel secure. I feel supported. And all of that concludes in chapter 8, verses 6 through 7. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is strong as death, jealousy is fierce as the grave, its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. Is there a gospel in this? Of course there is. Sin causes disunion. Sin causes us to become selfish. Even the very thing we had with each other becomes something about taking rather than giving. Sin caused decay in the world and in ourselves. And so when we fight and nag, when we take rather than give, when we notice imperfections, all we're doing is we're playing out the game of the fall. But the vision of the Song of Songs is to play out the story of the garden. The original story, when they were naked and unashamed. And if you can't be naked and unashamed with the one you're going to spend your life with that no one else is allowed into that garden, who can you? And it turns out that God sees us that way. And there's never a more intimate moment for you to reveal how God sees your spouse than when you see them that way. And when we do it right, we proclaim the gospel. Complete unity. Two becoming one. Complete unity unadulterated love, and everything about you is beautiful, or, to use Paul's language, without spot or wrinkle. And that brings me to the second point tonight. 
I know that we're imperfect at it. That's why the story has a second meaning. The speaker I quoted at the beginning, he laughed at anyone who would turn this into an allegory. Well, I hate to break it to him. The church did for, you know, centuries. And there's a lot of really good things to say about it as an allegory about Christ and the church. But of course it is. The whole creation is an allegory about Christ and the church. Remember how the Bible says all of creation was made by him and for him? Remember how it says that he put all things under his feet? That he is the head of the body, the church? Don't you think we expect to see something every place we turn and get a vision of God's loveliness and what it means to be his special chosen people. There's plenty of great thought about Christ in the church here. And if you feel squeamish about that, I want to tell you two things. First of all, we already do it in our songs. Look in chapter two, verse one. Chapter two, verse one, and maybe you'll remember that song, Jesus, Rose of Sharon. That's from this book. Or chapter two, verse four. He invites us into his banquet table and his banner over us is love. I sing that with the kids. That's from this book. And not just that, Paul does it. Paul says he's giving advice in the book of Ephesians. And I know it sounds in the front end like he's giving marital advice, but he's really talking about Christ in the church. He says so, but it turns out really good theology about Christ in the church makes marriage better. It makes every relationship better. And what he says is, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. It's so interesting that the love is, starts with the one who had every right to make demands but instead it was entirely giving. We see that in this book. And not just that, I love this line. You know why he died and gave himself up for her? To make her holy. I want you to note this. Not because she was holy. Next next time your spouse points out your wrinkles and gray hair, you have every right to say, you gave them to me. And then step back and apologize. Here's what I want you to understand. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, not because she was deserving of it. Not because she was holy, but to make her holy. In this book, everything that either one of them sees is perfect. And anybody who's been married more than a day knows it's not perfect. Did you know that God still sees his church without spot or wrinkle or blemish or any such thing? And you and I look around. I mean, talk to elders or deacons that are involved in people's lives and then with a straight face say, can you tell me that everything's going perfect here? And God says, I know about that. I know even more than you know. And let me tell you something. What I see is a glorious church. And when you know that God sees you that way, it makes you want to live up to it. It's a beautiful story. It's the gospel story. Who would have thought that even how we treat our spouses is a gospel story? What if our love was that pure? What if we really believed that we are the bride of Christ? That God sees us and talks to us and about us the way Solomon talks about his bride. And what if in every area of our life, we acted in such a way that it was obvious that we felt the same way about him? I'm just amazed when I read these stories from the book of Acts and from other people in the first century who described the Christians There was no hiding it. There was no faking it. It was obvious. In Acts 4, the apostles are preaching about Jesus and they're beating them. And they say, we can keep beating us. I can't help it. I got to talk about Jesus. They just couldn't help it. It It's like the water was gushing and they couldn't help it overflow. And that's when they stopped and they said, wait a second. You're not trained well. You're not taught well. I knew you back when you were just lowly fishermen. Something's different about you. Oh yeah, you've been with Jesus. 
It's obvious. Or Tertullian in the second century who says, you know what everybody says about the Christians? Look at how they love each other. Look how they'll die for each other. It's the way that you describe that newlywed couple or the way you describe that look in each other's eyes when you're there at the wedding and you see them say, I do, I do. And you've been married for a long time and you think you have no idea what you do. But it's the complete pure innocence, the sense of, I don't know what's coming, whatever it is, we're going to, we're going to go through this together. And I'm yours and you're mine. How do you recapture that? Well, some people in their marriages try to recapture it with ceremonies. Have you ever been to or had a rededication ceremony? I've been to one of those. And you see people renew their vows to each other. You know that it's not necessary. Those vows they made originally are still there. You know that, I know that. It's a way of reminding yourself, I still do, I still do. And it's quite beautiful. What I love that in our baptism, it's a once for all kind of announcement to God that I want to belong to you and a once for all rainbow in the sky of God's announcement to us. You have my spirit. You have been raised to new life. Don't forget it. And when you do forget it, I'll remind you, you're new. You're mine. I bought you. I married you. I loved you. Use whatever analogy you want. You're mine. But we forget. We forget. And so he institutes a second major ceremony. And we do this every Sunday. Every Sunday, we renew our vows to the Lord. Christ comes to us, and we come to him, but we don't actually say this, but we come to him with our broken week. Oh, the things we said to the kids on Monday we really shouldn't have, and then repeat it on Tuesday and Thursday. All those mistakes and frustrations, the gossip and the lie, the, the pride, the anxiety, all this stuff that I struggled with this week. And I come Sunday and I say, God, you, you know, I don't know where to start, but you know. And Christ says, take, eat. This is my body. This intimate sharing, take and feast of my body. That's the kind of language you get in Song of Songs. I want you. I want you, I want you to want me, and I want to renew this covenant together every single week. Or to use the language of Solomon, take, eat, be drunk with love. Hear the gospel in the Song of Songs.